Welcome to the Photo Flunky Show, episode 150. Today we're going to be talking about 10 mistakes I made when starting portrait photography. Hi, my name is William Beam. Hi, I'm Lee Beam. And we are here to help you improve your photography with visual storytelling. And with today's episode, we've really got three things we hope you can take away from this. And that is to avoid mistakes by knowing your gear, to avoid mistakes by working on your composition. And finally, don't screw it up in post-processing. Oh, yeah. But before we get to that, I just want to let you know that show notes are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode 150. And we would absolutely love it if you would subscribe to us. If you're listening on your mobile device and want to subscribe right now, that would be cool. If not, just go to williambeam.com slash iTunes. It'll take you right there and you can subscribe. We'd love to have you as a subscriber. You'll get the show delivered to you pretty much every time it comes out on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And one other thing, episode 150, this is coming out the first Wednesday of January 2019. So happy new year. Yeah, many stuff's planned for the new year. And if you have not found us at the time that this is coming out, you discovered us later on and you're thinking, well, this is not new year right now. Okay, well, we're still happy to have you here. <laughs> it is. You just found us at, when it was older. <laughs> All right. Why don't we go ahead and get started with our main points. And the first one I had listed on here was not knowing which genre I preferred. And that kind of goes with photography in general. But I knew that I wanted to get into portrait photography. I guess there's kind of an urge for a lot of photographers to start shooting scantily clad young women or to do certain types of portrait photography. And I didn't really know which way I wanted to go at first. Yeah, or the head and shoulders. I remember there was this stage where all the like kind of head and shoulder portraits were kind of slightly desaturated and then really overexposed on purpose. Like the blacks and highlights and everything were slid all the way up to 100. It was this strange thing. And once or twice, the first few times I saw one, I thought, oh, that looks nice. You know, maybe it was a big picture hanging on a wall somewhere. But then I started, I noticed as soon as something comes up, somebody likes and it's different, suddenly everyone's doing it and it's not different. It gets old really quickly. Yeah, it turns into a fad rather than your personal style if, you know, if it catches on like that. And that's, that's kind of a shame because if it's just one person's own style, then it's unique and it stands out and you know what you're getting when you go into that photographer. When everybody does it, and particularly if they don't do it well, yeah. then it's just like you're thinking, oh, it just ruined it for me. Yes. In my case, I've I've photographed a lot of young models. And they're wonderful people, but I've learned that I don't really want to get into the really sexy genre of portrait photography. That's not that's not what makes me happy. Don't get me wrong. I love beautiful women as much as anyone else. That's why I married one. <laughs> but I am really more into storytelling portraits. And that was what really helped me move forward with my portrait photography. Once I knew what I wanted to do, I want to say, who is this person? Why is he or she there? What do they do with their life? And I want to bring that out in a story in the photograph. That's kind of what I decided I was after. And that's when my photography started to kind of get down into a niche and I could start refining everything that I wanted to yeah, do. Yeah, you really focus on, on what you're doing. Yeah, you, you know what uh, lenses work. You know what lighting works. You know what colors work. And you learn why. That's really important. It's so important to know why you're doing something and to know which subjects work for you and which ones don't. Yes, all right, the next one, and this is, again, it's something that I think every photographer should know, but with portrait photography, it really is important, is avoid ugly backgrounds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, and by ugly backgrounds, I don't necessarily mean, you know, like the girls who take selfies with in the bathroom mirror and then have their laundry hamper or whatever, the toilet in the background. I'm yeah, just, apparently that's just perfectly acceptable now. I, I, I don't know when we got over this. Um, what I learned is that I really like minimalist photos. I have anything that does not belong in the portrait, I want removed. I well, want it distracts to find... from your subject. Exactly. Right? So it's like you've got all this clutter background. Even if you've got a beautiful lens that has wonderful bokeh, it is still distracting because you can tell that there are shapes or colors or lines, something back there, things that take away from the attention of your subject. So ugly backgrounds, it's like, and sometimes this is simply a matter of turning to one side or another. That's true. Yeah, just reposition yourself for your subject. Another one was not using flash sooner. I've been using flash photography before I really got into portraits, but I was also uh, one of those people who was just out, you know, running and gunning, taking uh, portraits in daylight or whatever light was available. And it's just, I need that flash to kind of really emphasize their face, their features, 
maybe it's going to be a rim light on the background of them, but embracing flash just brings your portrait photography up to a really more professional level, I think. Yeah, it really does. I mean, I, I did start trying to use flash. The problem is I knew that I should be using it. I didn't know how to use it. And the only time that I really used it a lot was outside. I know. And this is one of the things that we're going to try and do more in 2019 to help. I'm looking forward to hopefully creating a course on flash photography. For those of you that are not really confident with your flash, I would appreciate your feedback. Let me know what you're looking for. You know, you can tell us in the show notes and just leave a comment and say, what are you looking for with flash? But what I am looking at with not only not using flash sooner, but kind of narrowing down which light modifiers work the best. I mean, people know soft boxes, they know umbrellas, and they know beauty dishes. But do you know which one to use and why? And who do you use it on? What circumstances do you use it? When do you use gelled lights? When do you need a rim light? All those little things. As soon as I started embracing flash and putting that in there, that also really helped me step up my game with portrait photography. All right, the fourth item on our list is thinking the gear would create better photos. And to some extent, it does help you. I remember lens lust. I was really after the Nikon 85 millimeter 1.4 lens. Yes. And it creates some really beautiful bokeh. And a lot of people love that as a portrait lens. But in hindsight, I didn't need it. I already had a Nikon 70 to 200 millimeter. I could rank that thing out. Even though it's f2.8 instead of f1.4, I could rack that out and create just as beautiful bokeh, I think, at 200 millimeters. And I wouldn't have the razor thin depth of field that you do at f1.4. And that's been helpful in some cases on portraits, but you've got to be careful at f1.4. You find out that the focus is so thin that if your model or subject's face is at an angle to you, one eye will be in focus and one eye will not. Yeah, generally that doesn't really work in a portrait. There are always going to be exceptions, but... It, it really doesn't work very well. You want to see the eyes sharp, clear, and in focus. Even if you go maybe from the ears backward out of focus, I'm, I'm okay if you know somebody's ears are a little bit fuzzy, but their eyes have to be in focus. And what it turns out to be is thinking that the gear would create better photos. Instead, I had to stop down in order to avoid that shallow depth of field. And I thought... Well, I didn't really need this lens as much right? as I thought I did. Yeah. So sometimes you think the gear is going to create better photos and it introduces problems that you didn't anticipate. That's true. There's, I, I, I like to say there's always a trade-off. I mean, even if you don't have criticism of a piece of gear, there is always a trade-off when you change your equipment in one way or another. Yes. And you got to be careful of other people telling you how great the gear is. Because they don't want to tell you the mistakes or problems that they've found. They say, oh, yeah, you need to know that the depth of field is real shallow. And they don't tell you that before you buy it. You find out after the fact. And you really have to do your research to understand both the benefits and the pitfalls of a new piece of gear. And they may be doing something very different to what you are, even if they're shooting the same genre of photography. So when someone says that their this particular lens is absolutely perfect, that may be the case with the type of photos they're taking, you know, taking some, you know, photos of close up shots of bees on a on a flower. Um, that's different to somebody taking a family portrait. And, you know, with a group of people, it's almost impossible to get everybody sort of level and in focus. Oh, you wouldn't with a group but, of people, you'd never get them all. With well, I'm talking about with the one point. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, you're right. Yeah, but it was just to clarify. But. The point is that if your purpose is different, they could very well be telling you the truth, but it might be a different outcome for you. Well, they either have a different purpose or they may be looking at a different result. So, for example, I mentioned the bokeh with that F1.4 lens is beautiful, and it is. For some people, the bokeh is the picture. I've seen people out on Flickr posting photos that are nothing but blurry, and they love it because of the bokeh that's in there. I'm thinking, well... That I, I get what they're looking at. It isn't necessarily what I want to do with my photography. Yeah, maybe if you're making backgrounds. Yeah, the, and it serves a purpose, but just make sure you understand what your purpose is and if the gear will really solve a problem for you rather than just giving in to lens lust and, and thinking the gear itself is going to make better photos. It just doesn't work that way. All right, number five on my list was over-processing my photos. Yeah, I think oh, we've all done this. I think everybody's done that. And what really... A lot of people, I think, think of skin texture and, and over-processing, but there are really no texture in the skin left. My big problem or mistake I made was whitening the eyes. They were so brilliantly white. <laughs> yeah. It's like it was creepy yeah. looking back at you, or maybe the irises were too bright. But it even goes deeper than that. If you think about it, 
when you're whitening the eyes, you don't whiten every part of the eye to the same level because basically you, you need to have some shading at the edges in order to give dimension. If you look at artists and, and Lee can talk to this because she can actually draw and I can't. <laughs> if you draw a circle, you've got a flat circle. If you want to turn into a ball, you have to put in some shading to show the dimension yeah. of that ball. Well, an eyeball is no different. The absolute corners should not be as bright as the part near the iris. This is true. Or yeah. else you kind of lose that dimension. And that was one of the mistakes I made. I just made everything white and erased every vein that was in there. And then I had these creepy looking eyes looking back at me. But that was that was definitely a process. And you know what? It's an understandable process. Nobody starts off doing everything right. You make mistakes. You figure out what's wrong and you adjust. And those are some of the mistakes I made, you know, when starting portrait processing was my post-processing. And the eyes were definitely something that annoyed me much more than skin did. I, I hear you. I think we've all done it. You know, you're kind of trying to find whatever software you're using. You're trying to find where you are with the sliders. And instinctively, you look at things one at a time. And generally, the trend is that they're shifted too far to the right. You learn over time how to bring that down, become a little bit more natural. I, I think also another pro common problem with overprocessing is over sharpening and then uh, removing noise or smoothing. Those are, I think, two that really get taken to the extreme where you look at and think, OK, is this a photo or a picture? Yes, yeah, like there's no noise, but then again, you've smeared all the detail away. Yeah. So it's it's a balance. And honestly, I would rather accept some noise and have some detail where I need it than just smooth everything out that it just looks unrealistic. Yeah. And. All right, so another one is when you're taking your photos, if you don't know your camera gear very well, you can get very distracted while you're working with a model or a subject, and you might inadvertently change your camera settings. Yeah, I've done this too many times. You did one, and it wasn't a portrait, but you were talking about you did this, and you changed the setting of the type of file that you were saving. I did. I was. It was travel photography. We were out all day. We are on vacation, and I mean, I, I think we were gone for about 10, 12 hours. And I took hundreds of photos that day and somewhere within, I'd say within the first three hours, it wasn't right at the start. The sun was glaring on the back of the screen. I must have hit something and had the menu setting on. I don't know what I did, but basically when I got back and put the memory card into the laptop, the resolution was horrible. And I realized that I'd saved these in the tiniest, most space saving economical uh, format. And every last one of them was entirely useless. You could not do, I mean, they weren't even good for posting on social media. You could, you could do nothing with them. And I've done it more than once. The difference is that I, I check now. If I think I've touched something, I look. And imagine if you're shooting portraits for somebody and you need to be able to send them some results. And then you find out, oh no, I've saved this in a JPEG and I've saved it in the wrong size. And on top of that, maybe I've got the wrong white balance and I can't really correct it. Yeah. You need to be certain of your controls and your settings. And and really what that comes down to, I think, is just slowing down. That's true. I mean, when you're shooting, you have to shoot in the moment, but slow down before and slow down after and check. Review your stuff as you work. Mm -hmm. And all right, the next one on my list is bad posing. And this is kind of a combination between you and your subject, but... I've seen some very well executed photographs that I've taken that really weren't that good simply because I did not have the correct pose on, on the subject. Mm -hmm. And, you know, an arm is in the wrong place or, you know, the, this is particularly a troublesome if you have too much of a wide angle lens, like you're trying to do an environmental portrait, anything that gets closer to you gets larger. I've done this intentionally sometimes for, you know, an impact or an effect where I had somebody holding something out in their hand, and that was really the main thing that I wanted to show. But if you do this sometime and somebody kicks their foot up at you or they reach out and just whatever, they break the plane of where their head and body is, those items with a wide angle lens are going to be larger. You need to make sure that when you're posing, you're posing in mind of the focal length that you're using and how also you want to flatter the subject. Sometimes yeah, I'm going to go back to a time when I was a subject for somebody else who's a friend of mine and he had a studio and he was taking a portrait of me. And I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to do what he says because he can see me and he's doing this best. I looked at that portrait and I thought, man, I, I know I'm a big guy, but I look even bigger in this photograph. Yeah. I, I I wanted to trash that photograph faster than anything I could. And I've it's one of those things I, I actually kind of, at the time I would practice at home in the mirror after that, I say, is there a better angle for me? So, well, yeah, there is. If your jawline is a little heavy like mine is, 
you kind of stick it out, stick your jawline forward a little bit, and it tightens up around your jaw. So you're you're not necessarily showing a lot of heavy weight there. If you have a larger nose, you don't want to do that from the side or an angle that's going to amplify it. Or a previously broken nose. That's another one where some angles you see it and some you don't. And sometimes, you know, the best way to shoot somebody maybe is a profile, but you need to pose them to flatter your subjects. And I did not give enough attention to posing when I first started uh, portrait photography. I just thought, you know, as long as I've got a good looking person up there, I can just put them up there and take any picture and it'll look great. No, you can make a beautiful person look bad if you don't know what you're doing. Yes, absolutely. And they're not going to be your friend for very long after that. This is another problem. Okay. Number eight on my list was snapshot mentality. It's like, all right, I got a subject. And the first thing I want to do is I just want to start taking pictures like crazy before he or she gets away. Yeah. Do you know, I've actually known, and I don't mean known as we knew each other well, but I've been in the presence of photographers where it's like, it's almost like a big step count goal or something. How many times can I click the shutter in a day? Oh, I reeled off like 500 shots today. Well, how many did you keep? Exactly. And I don't mind if you just keep one or two, but I don't really care how many it took to get there because you're not going to show them. Actually, usually these are the people who dump the memory card onto their social media, Oh, which yeah. is probably why we're not friends. <laughs> <laughs> My thought with the snapshot mentality was when I first started shooting models, I thought, okay, I don't know exactly what I'm doing, so I just need to take a lot of pictures and hopefully I'll get a keeper. But also, I've learned over the years, I really slow down a lot. I am spending less time taking photos than I am looking at my background, looking at the pose, looking at the lighting and all these other little factors. When I click the shutter, I want to kind of know what I'm getting as a result. And if I didn't, then I'm just tweaking it. Whereas snapshot mentality is you're trying to discover what you're looking for. While you're working. Yeah. And, and there are situations where you are you don't have the luxury of time, but I think certainly because what you're doing now is you're preparing in advance. You're trying I, to get your scene set up so that when it comes to taking the photos, you can take the photos. There are some stages of photography where you just work your way around the scene trying to discover what you want to do. And I get that. And, and I'm not saying that that is the wrong thing to do. But I've gotten to the point now where I really want to know. I want the end in mind before I take my shot. Yeah. I, I say that over and over again on this podcast. And, and it's really the way I like to work. I want to start with the end in mind. And... That means I know what the what the scene is supposed to look like. I know what kind of wardrobe or, you know, makeup or hairstyle is going to be on the subject. I know what the background is going to look like. I know everything. I've got this little imagination in my head, and then I just go make it happen. And if it doesn't happen quite the way I thought, I usually only have to move a light a couple of inches. I might have to move a pose an inch or two. It's not like it's all a surprise. Whereas... I used to be kind of like, you know, if you watched Austin Powers when he was doing his little photography in the movie, he's like, I'm snapping, I'm snapping, I'm snapping. I pretend you're a wood chipmunk or something. I don't know. And then throw the camera over his shoulder and said, I'm done. <laughs> yes. So with the snapshot mentality is kind of like that. You're discovering. I don't want to discover when I go into a portrait photo shoot. I want to go in there with a concept in mind. That doesn't mean that once you're there and you got what you're after, that you can't explore some and say, all right, can we get something else? Can we, can you know, collaborate on the spot? and come up with something that we didn't consider in advance. I think that's a good thing to do. But I walk in there knowing that this is the shot that I want or a series of shots that I want. I'm going to get those. Then I'll explore and see yeah, what else is there. Go in with the purpose and work for, work towards it. Then see what the bonuses are. And and that's that's just the mentality I have now. When I started off, it was just like snapshot after snapshot. All right, nine on the list. Poor composition. Yeah, this uh, is such a common mistake. Well, think about it particularly with portrait photography. I, I spent time, you know, thinking the low angle was great. And I'm shooting up people's noses and it's not a flattering look because what happens when you get down too low and you're shooting up at someone's head? Remember what I said, particularly with a wide angle lens, the things that are closer to you are bigger and the things that are further away are smaller. So you've made their jaw enormous, their nose pretty big, and then the top of their head. And their small. eyes, that means their eyes are kind of small as well. Yeah. That so. Angle. That composition in line with what focal length you're using can have a really dramatic impact on on what's happening. And it's like you need to think about your composition. What kind of curves do you want in their body? Where should their where should they be bending? Where should they be straight? Where should they be in relationship to any other objects that are in the photograph? And again, that comes back to you know starting with the end in mind. Yeah. But poor composition will ruin any photograph in any genre. And it was something that. 
I guess it comes oh, kind of goes back to snapshot mentality. I used to just show up and say, okay, what do we got? And start taking pictures. Mm-hmm. And the more I realize if I want good photos, I need to consider all these things before I pick up the camera. And the last one on my list was shooting from the wrong perspective. We just kind of mentioned that a little bit. And by perspective, we're talking about, are you shooting at eye level height? Are you getting a little bit lower? Are you shooting above them? Almost nobody looks really good if you're shooting from above them, shooting down. But you can get too low, and unless you're going for like a really dramatic kind of scene, almost like a propaganda photo, that doesn't really flatter them either. It depends. Um, yeah. I'm and now I'm talking about phone, iPhone shots. So you've got a wide angle lens on there, but I can tell you now that I take maybe about ten percent of my photos actually where you know I have them shot from above. I'm not talking about like straight down, top down, but the camera is above me, kind of looking down at an angle. That is a much more flattering view for me, especially if there are shadows and there's certain kinds of light um, challenges involved than shooting from the bottom up. And I used to try and be polite and grateful. You know, somebody's taking my phone, they're going to get a picture of me, like especially at the gym afterwards when I get a picture. And one of the coaches came and grabbed my phone a couple of months ago and got down to ground level. And I said, please don't do that. I said, you have to stand up. And he said, oh, no, it's so much better. I've got friends who are photographers and we know this. I said, well, tell your photographers you're taking a photo of an idiot who doesn't know any better. And I want my photos from the top down because I know what I'm going to look like when he's going to take photos where my kneecaps Mm -hmm. are bigger than my shoulders. Um, And I don't need to go into it. I don't need to go and tell him, oh, yeah, I'm into photography. I didn't need to say anything. He said, look, you can tell him I don't know anything, but this is what I want. So be assertive. If you have an angle, know your angle. Know if you have a side that you're not crazy about. That's all very true. And When I'm shooting with a DSLR, usually I'm trying to shoot as close to 200 millimeters as I can. I will get down below eye level because I want to give the model a bit of presence over me. And and that's assuming that the model is standing. You know, if if the model's in a chair or relaxing or something like that, then then my angle or perspective is going to change. But that perspective that works with a 200 millimeter, it does not work with a wide angle. I was going to say with a 200, you can do that. And so this guy was probably right. Maybe his photographer friends were shooting with a 200. That is a different story. But with a a wide angle. Quite honestly, you've corrected me on that. There have been times that, you know, she's asked me to go take some photos. My automatically I start to drop down on a knee to take photos. She's no, 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 no. Yep. Don't do that. Because I know also I'm, you know, I'm not a young girl. I'm, you know, I'm not a 20 something or even a 30 something. So photos taken from the bottom down are not going to be flattering on me in any case, even without distortion. Um, You want to at least get level or shoot from very slightly above. And those were the 10 mistakes I made when starting portrait photography. The reason I wanted to bring this list up is hopefully you will not make the same mistakes in your portraits. Thank you so much for joining us on the Photo Flunky Show. We would really love it if you would subscribe to us. Just go to williambeam.com slash iTunes. And if you're looking to subscribe someplace else like Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, go to photoflunky.com. We've got a player there. You can listen to this show and past episodes. And also there are links to subscribe to those services. We really appreciate you. Happy New Year. Thank you so much for being here. And we'll see you again next week.